Angela, it seems to me that things are changing. They're changing fast. It's almost like not just the moon, but it's like the past has been dredged up. What we need to work on, our challenges. And I think many of us forget that as human beings, we have a makeup. We are basically energy beings. But this is not new to you because you've always been sensitive. And in fact, you felt this sensitivity of energy since you were four years old. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So what I spent most like? of my school years. Wow. I spent what most was of my like? school years. Yes. Um, all my school years, I felt exhausted by the energy probably of everybody else. But my biggest memory is feeling tired all the time, running out of energy. Yes. I, didn't, yes. I didn't know I was being so affected by everyone else. That's amazing. And especially if you can feel their, your, their pain, what was that like? Hi, Bridie. Um, oh, well, that's a very interesting idea. I don't just feel everybody's pain in the world. I only feel people's pain when they're transmitting, i.e. their body wants to get some help. Mm. And because I'm a receiver or a barometer, I pick that up. So, so it isn't it, what we might think. It isn't like um, telepathy that you pick up their thoughts. It's actually their bodies are transmitting that energy. Exactly. Oh, how amazing. That's fascinating. Yeah. So um, often it can happen when the head of somebody doesn't even know that they want to choose to get some help. But the oh, body really? always. Oh, yeah, yeah. The body knows way before the mind. Wow. What sort of things should we look for if our body needs help? And we're unaware, as most of us are. <laughs> well, th there are quite a lot of people who don't know how to feel into their body. So I try uh -huh. and always talk about really, really basic stuff. Like when you get in the bath or the shower to rub your whole body with a flannel, because that gives you traction through the deeper layers of the skin. And what happens is you are then made aware of tender spots, as we think they are. And what they actually are is probably... Um, pressure points that are starting to block so meridians may not be flowing clearly hmm. interesting so it's almost like when you do a reflexology you look out for the tender points and yes. you're saying when we when we have a bath we could do the same and feel a little bit under the skin if there are any absolutely. tender areas absolutely Gosh, so, so so once a week say allow longer and have a maintenance session where you work methodically all the way through the body and you check what tender points you have. When you feel a lot of energy or you absorb it like an energetic sponge, that's, that's quite a good plan to do. So you clear everything down once a week. Do you use salt or it isn't necessary to cleanse the energy? Um, no, especially if I've seen somebody for the first time and there's a massive exchange of energy going on, I need to get in a salt bath after that. Okay, okay. So I guess it depends where you've been. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about, about um, I really am interested in your journey because you started with not knowing that you were highly sensitive or perhaps even like most of us not being encouraged to develop the certain sensitivity that you have as an ability. But yeah. somehow you also started working with the body. And the point that I want to put across is that people forget we are souls in physical bodies and how the physical body is really the first point port of call. Do you Absolutely. agree? Absolutely. Oh, yes, yes. It's, it's how we are here. It's how the soul can do what it needs to do. Without the body, it would be um, completely pointless. So, um, yes, I started having a keen interest in biology at school, human biology. I pursued that even after school by myself. And... Then I started exploring nutrition when I was only about 17, getting involved in acid alkali. What was that all about? Because to me, something said it was really obvious and I needed to know this. And then I, I got into working about two years later on looking at the lymphatic system. And wow. what, why that's interesting is because it's like a bucket for the emotions that get stuck in the mm. body. I didn't know that mm. then, but I was already working stuff out in a, a sort of reverse way. Wow, but that's too, too young. You've really started early. Did it seem strange to you or did it seem second nature? It seems second nature, always, yeah. always. Um, yeah. 
I think because I always had this compassion about how everybody feels, uh, whatever age they are, I just seemed to know what they felt. And even they didn't have to talk to me about it. I just knew. Is, is that what your book is about? Um, no, the book really, the first part is explaining in a non-sensationalist way some of the things that I went through so that mm -hmm. you can understand the cause and effect. So massive amounts of stress and how that depleted the body. But then I write about what I went on to do about it. And so I'm encouraging people to think for themselves because, as I always say, nobody knows your body like you. Nobody yes. knows how your body feels except you. So you have to start listening. And when you do, and you, you know, it becomes um, like a monitor running in the background, it can become more enjoyable. So why not do that? Why, why go running off all the time to somebody else to ask them what's wrong with your body? It doesn't Absolutely. make sense to me. I, I think it's also more empowering if you're in touch with your own body and you're able to guide it. Maybe yeah. it's not as complicated as people think it is. No, it's Maybe not. It's... it's not. Okay. Uh, Can you the, tell us a little easiest... bit? Yeah, one of the best ways, we have um, these eyes which give us too much visual stimulus all the time. It's alluring, it's exciting, and it's distracting. So when you go to bed at night and you switch off the light, then you can start listening to what your body's trying to tell you. Um, mm. I bet you, you know a time when you've woken up in the night and you start to notice all these things your body's trying to tell you, or your mm. subconscious even. But this is the best time to listen. It's almost like when you're awake and, you know, it's either too cold or too hot or you want a drink of water. It's, it's really the body that wakes you up because you're, yes. you're fast asleep and it, it kind of says, hey, knock, knock, I need, I need attention. Is exactly. it somewhat like, um, you know, when you say today I feel like having broccoli or tomorrow I feel like mushrooms with, with an omelette or something. It, it yes. can be a very subtle sensation, can't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And the body tells you when it's um, short of something, when it's depleted in something. So these um, cravings or things you're drawn to are just telling you, hey, I need some of this right now. Hmm. And tell me a little bit about the alkali acid thing, because we are walking batteries, aren't we? Yes, yes. Um, one of the things that has always interested me is people go banging on about doing detoxes and trying to become more alkaline. But that acid alkaline balance is actually very finely tuned. And, mm. and if we push too much in one direction, um, we're not necessarily doing the balance. a favor. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that when you work out what your metabolic type is, you may naturally be more alkaline. For instance, a parasympathetic dominant. Uh, that's a part of the nervous system. Or you may be more naturally more acid if you're sympathetic dominant. Now, those are, that's your cellular makeup. So if you are one and you are trying to be the other, that's not normal for you and you won't feel oh, at see. your best in that way. So you have to find a balance. So you can have a functioning norm as well as a cellular norm. And they're not necessarily the same. How, um, how can we figure out what type we are? Well, an easy way is, um, Citrus fruits are alkaline producing in the body. So mm -hmm. if you try, uh, for instance, some fresh orange and then wait for 20 minutes and see how you feel after that, does it make you feel better or worse? Oh, really? The opposite of that is to have something very acidic, like, for instance, um, meat. I can't think of a vegetarian version of something that's acidic, um, unless perhaps asparagus or cauliflower. They are high purine, though. It's not quite the same. Mm. But then... You wait, do you feel better or worse? It's a bit oh, like really? when you go to get your eyes tested. Yeah. And, mm. and so people can be really ill and they have a little bit of what they need and suddenly they start to perk up. Oh, wow. So if you feel better, then that's the right thing for you, basically. And yes. not push yourself to go the other way around. I remember yes. there's a, I, I have a cousin in, in Jordan and she's always been, um, you know, drinking. She dropped coffee, tea. She drinks green tea like all the time and then you know our doctor in jordan my mom's doctor in jordan actually said don't have too much green tea because you could be releasing a lot of toxins more than your body can deal with yeah exactly i, I found that surprising that <laughs> you know like don't go overboard in detoxing because actually you could be unleashing quite a no, lot more than the body can deal with 
Yeah, the best way to detox is not in spurts twice a year in actual fact. For some people, it's far better to do it gradually all the time by moderation, mm. by taking um, bitter tinctures. Swedish bitters are great. But, you know, plants like dandelions and so on, wonderful to support the liver. I had, I had um, a lady come and see me and she complained of long-term digestion that wasn't effective. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what are you doing then? She said, oh, well, I go and buy a bag of lemons every week and I'm always having lemon juice. I said, well, what does that tell you? I said, lemon juice produces alkaline in the body. I said, you keep stopping your digestion. So when your food gets to your gut, it doesn't have the necessary consistency to assimilate properly. I said, so your energy is probably reduced too. I saw her a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks later I saw her and she said, I bin the lemons and I feel so much better. Amazing. Wow. That reminds me of another friend who's always drinking lemon and, and warm water like all day, all night. So yeah. actually we could be damaging the chemistry of our body. Yeah. Too much of anything is not the right way. You have to be able to listen to each message and not keep driving the show with the head. Too wow. much head stuff is, is not good. Yeah. And as yeah. you know, the, the concept these days is to educate oneself. But the trouble is, because people don't want to learn a whole raft of information, they grasp little bits and they try and do that too much. Yes, yes. Little knowledge can be very dangerous <laughs> yes, if you take yeah. it in isolation. Yeah, yes. you and I were talking um, before the live show, we were talking yesterday, and we were saying that it's quite important to have a holistic view of one's life, of one's body, of one's life path. And it seems to me that you have such extensive experience, not only the knowledge of the physical body, because, you know, you've been absolutely helpful to me when my husband passed away. And, and in my grieving, you said, Sahar, touch this point, touch that point, And you sent me a picture. And wow, what a difference that made. It really helped me that, that week, you know, right after he passed away. Yeah. Is, is but, that something um, you sense, you feel... Yes, because I have this intrinsic knowing of how important it is to keep the energy flowing because I, I just know from all my observing, I'm an investigator, so I'm always observing and feeling. So I know mm -hmm. how it can throw you out and disturb your whole life by not having that balance. So when a client comes to see you, you kind of sense your way through their map? Yes, um, I I'm, generally my eyes are drawn to one particular place and usually that's the place where the key is to unlock everything there but I listen to their story and I encounter different messages within the body so it's not just one place but the mm. interesting thing is I have to slide in gently be beneath all the, the head talk and when they relax that's when the body will open up but some, many really? times, yeah, many times I just put my hands on their feet and all these messages rush out of the body to greet me as if to say, oh, thank goodness for that. We've been waiting for somebody to tell this stuff really? for ages. <laughs> really? That's fantastic. That's amazing. So, yeah. so whatever the issue is, it could lurk around as a cellular memory or as a pocket of energy that has yeah. not been processed or integrated. And then you're drawn yes. to it. And yes. you basically communicate with it. Yes. Fascinating yeah. stuff. And how, how would you release it? Or how does the client um, release it? Or how does the I remedy just, happen? I, I can just put my hands on that point, just very lightly, and it just rushes through me. Sometimes the client feels the energy move. Most often they don't. But um, I try and encourage them to, to learn how to feel so that they can take this away and know how to deal with it themselves in future. Could they be but, talking oh, about something and then, sorry, and then something else is happening? Like, would the body tell you something that they're not talking about? Absolutely, yes. Really? They, yes, they usually talk about symptoms and how things become manifest, whereas I'm looking for the reason that that came about in the first place. So what you're saying is that our body knows what the priorities are, which may not be what we oh, think yes. they are. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. You know, the mind thinks in mainstream materialistic world way, but the body 
simply wants to get over the root cause and have shut of a problem. What, what are the vulnerable parts of the body or is everyone different? No, um, down on the left side of the abdomen is usually the place where uh, left side relates to subconscious. But it's usually the place where we hold the deepest issues that have affected us emotionally the most. So I'll always check there. Um, there are a, a few people where they don't stash emotions in that way. And then it's hidden somewhere else cleverly in the body. For instance, under the Achilles tendon. Mm. And, and so I might check there as well. But if they are very a very mental person, um, I'll ask them what persistent pains they've had in a particular place. For instance, the shoulder pain might mm. relate to small intestine issues. So where Sorry, I missed lot... that. I missed that because it's a little bit slightly chopping off. So the left shoulder relates to what? Small intestine. Oh, really? So where, yeah. So imagine we have a planetary arrangement that is bringing up a lot of old issues. Those issues create anxiety in the individual which disturb the natural functioning of the intestine, that creates the pain in the shoulder. Wow. So you see how everything affects everything else. So it's like all, all the organs basically are, you know, kind of like, again, reflexology, or you, you can feel all the organs are connected. I mean, I know I'm trying to build up an idea here, but I want to say that it's not just the small intestine, something else could be going on and it's reflected in the shoulder. And to make that connection between the shoulder and the small intestine is absolutely amazing. Yeah. But, is you it know, about like... releasing though, because it's a small intestine? Um, it is about releasing the anxiety. So you have the to anxiety. look at what, what's creating the fear. And, and then once you've released that, then the anxiety subsides and then the shoulder problem goes. What creates fear? Because it's probably the oldest emotion that most of us um, suffer from. Um, what I want to ask is, would you kind of be able to tell or sense if this is on a soul level? Like, has this been an issue through many lifetimes? Or is it to do with now? Or is it to do because the person stresses mentally? How, how do you discern like what you're dealing with energy? Which energy? Um, where it is in the body. For instance, okay. um, fears or um, grief may often reside in the, in the chest. Um, anxiety and uh, perhaps ancestral stuff can be in the gut. Oh, gosh. Um, you can have issues about processing the truth in the kidneys. Um, oh, there's a lot of emotional processing that goes on in the spleen, which is under the left side of the ribs. So if somebody's not coping with what they're trying to deal with in day-to-day -day life, the spleen can become agitated or inflamed. What about the liver? Liver can hold a lot of anger or rage um, and the gallbladder. So the gallbladder often works um, in opposition to the heart meridian and they can uh, throw each other out to some degree, but you can have a gallbladder imbalance for years and years. And of course, as you know, it's quite an easy operation to take that out nowadays. So, but it doesn't take away the issue. Wow. So then how do we process that issue? Or how would you work, for example, with a client? I, I mean, presumably they, sorry, they, presumably they come in, they have symptoms, and then you touch them or you sense as they talk what the issue is and which part of the body, is that right? And then Sometimes it's not, it's not clear cut. Sometimes okay. they, they um, maybe have not presented with many symptoms and it takes quite a bit of digging and maybe a couple of sessions for them to get to the point where you can access the mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. um, so then it's more about them being willing to work with this, willing to dig it up, because sometimes they don't want to. And this is why I never push. I never um, say you need X amount of appointments. I just say, come when you're ready. Hmm. You know, it's, so that it's, the body can open up and then yeah, the issue yeah. will unfold. I had, a, I had a lady a few weeks ago <laughs> and I'd never met her before, but a mutual friend had recommended her and she was very wary about coming. She was a very yes. nervous, anxious woman. And 
she came only because she had this massive right shoulder problem and she was a violinist. Wow. So what happened was, you see, in order for her to do what gave her joy, which is play the violin, she had to get her shoulder fixed. Oh, and, wow. But she only allowed me one hour because she said, I'm only paying you this much, you have this much time, and then I'm out of here. Wow. So, so I had to work very cleverly to actually get behind her mindset. And it was only in the last five minutes that I released something and her arm lifted up because she'd been keeping it clamped to the side so tightly to hold in her fears. And I released it and she cried and laughed at the same time oh. because she felt such she an amazing relief. She must have been relieved. Relief. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. But, you know, and then she ran away and she was, well, presumably okay because I haven't heard from her since. But <laughs> it was just so funny. <laughs> That you is know, really... I, I, I felt for her, but this yeah. is the grip of the mind. Yes, yes. So the soul contract, is that the human design? No, they're both no. separate. So the soul okay. contract illustrates the trajectory of the journey here, the purpose of that journey. The human design shows how your body, your vehicle is going to function. So you, you need to know how it works. Because we each so you can really yep. integrate both to have a bigger picture. Yeah. And then you add into okay. that how the physical body is functioning, how you as an individual are functioning. And people have to learn some of this stuff for themselves because you can't just take what someone else does, what works for them, and assume it's going to work for you. Brilliant. Can we take some questions? I don't know where the hour went, but we're almost over. If anyone has a question about the soul their path, their contract. Angela, how do you um, analyze the soul contract or assess it? Um, normally, you would work it out manually, but that takes a while. So I have some no, software. I meant, okay, oh, is it based on date of birth or is it based no, on? No, it's based on the name. The always, name also, always amazing. The name. Always the name. So the sound vibration is important. Yes, you, you transpose the letters into numbers. Oh, wow. And this is why it's important with non-English names to get the phonetics right. I'm, I think because I listen carefully, I can work that out quite quickly. But with some languages that have a very different pronunciation, you really have to stop and think about yes. it. Yes. You know, like yours was yes. not easy. But, <laughs> but so you I did listen, very well. I listen yeah. to the sound. And you have to do it the way that your parents pronounced the name when you were born. Yes. Not the way well, that you my make grandmother. Yeah. My grandmother walked in yelling, where is Sahar? And my mom said, who's Sahar? And she said, your daughter. So she's the one who, who named me, not even my parents. <laughs> your, your <laughs> but grandmother. I like it. I like it. Yeah, your my grandmother, grandmother. Was, was probably the psychic one. Probably. I mean, they all are the whole family. You know, yeah. they see things, they do things, they feel things. Yeah. And it was just interesting. You know, my parents went like, oh, okay. But I like it. I always thought mm. I fit it well. Yeah. And I know what you mean when you said the other day that some people don't look like their name. Mm -hmm. The whole vibration, not just the sound, you know. So yeah. sometimes, yeah, it feels. And I guess this is why we pick um, nicknames, you know, because we don't like Haitikva, because we don't like our names or we don't like bits of our names. Yes. Some names sound too old when you're young, you know. Some names sound too young when you're old. Yeah. You know how um, some Americans take on the name of the father? Yes. That, that means that the third and th Yeah, they have chosen to carry that person's energies through another lifetime. Oh, my so word. That is not a good idea. So it isn't a good thing to name your children after your parents or your no, mother in law no. or... And taking oh. is not good either because that dissipates. Really? Yeah. So it's best to stick with your name? Yes. Well, unless you don't like it, I suppose. Yeah, and if you, if you don't like it, then start looking at what you do want and then adjusting that name to bring in energies that you would like to have. Mm. And this, this is possible. You know, it's not beyond the realms of ability these days. Right. What if... I mean, energy is always changing. What if you... Yeah did not modify your name but you modified or you approached everything else mindfully 
could that still raise your vibration to meet what you're meant to do in this lifetime? To some degree. But if you, if you have a name that's really giving you a hard time, then it can actually wear down your core energy. Okay. So, so if it's a big issue, then it's worth looking into yes. what modulating the name, how the modulating the name can help. Yes. And uh, for instance, there are a couple of energies that come over as being really intense. So that person would probably get worn down really quickly or they simply agitate all the people around them. And I've seen people in a room like that, a room full of lots of people, and they have a space all around them. And it's so obvious. Mm, that's amazing. A, a common thing that I hear from some clients is I don't know what I was born to do. Yes. Um, I don't know what my life calling is. How would you help someone like that, Angela? Um, I would do a full reading for them and, and go into it in some depth because you can dig down and actually look at the main energies to work through and look perhaps in the family context and you can see what they've chosen to come in to learn. And from that, they, they will know, but the soul then can get that expression out of this is what you're here for. And when they hear the truth, they sigh a big sigh of relief. And it is so wonderful to see somebody hear their own truth. It is. Yeah, yeah. it is. Because it's a big, I mean, first you could feel down and depressed. And then it's a big relief when you know, I have a purpose and this is what I need yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when, when I deliver a reading that's really tough for somebody to take on board, you just have to gently lay it on them, let them go away for a few weeks, and then check in with them and say, how are you doing with this? But also, oh, wow. you ask them to keep replaying the recording, because again, it's hearing that truth, it takes a while to filter down. And then it does. They, they generally yeah. come back with more questions and perhaps look a bit further. Yes, yes. It does, because sometimes I think you don't, um, expect to hear or you expect to hear something else mm. and then there isn't that alignment of what I really need to hear am I, and am I open to receive it yeah. but it comes later as you say as it trickles yeah. through then suddenly the whole picture fits um, yes. I remember when I told you after my late husband died I said you know I don't know what to do it feels like I'm starting all over again and you said something I don't remember exactly but you said you're not starting back from square one and it yeah. isn't the same thing again. It's on a different... And, and just saying that has helped me kind of think in a different way. And it helped yeah. me not even think. I was kind of like directed, you know, in a different way. So yes. when Gitano, you know, like literally pinched me out of my grief and he said, you're coming on a show, you're doing this. And I never thought I'll be doing that. I'm uncomfortable in front of a camera. And now I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying this. I'm having fun. I yes. found that you know, really helpful. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to you, all, all the people who have helped me through the, what must have really is the toughest time of my life. So I, yes. I can't thank you enough, Angela. Do you want to tell our viewers what your website is it's and how called... to get in touch with you? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll write it on the post, shall I? Yeah, please. And you can always come back and answer comments. Yes. Um, did I miss any questions? Because I was listening to what you're saying. So finding life purpose, if someone is totally confused as to what they were born to do, that would probably need, yes, that's here it is. So Angela's website is myinformedbeing.net. Yes. And it's all one word. Yes. And you're also on Instagram and also on LinkedIn. Do, do you work with corporations, business people? I hope to get into that more. Um, I really am looking for a couple of case studies to do with the business name. The, does, so, does the same thing apply? Like the name of the company and would you tweak it or? Yes. Um, really? Yes. I, with my own business name, um, I remember spending a long time trying to arrive at this business name. But what happened was, because it was shortly after I'd optimized my name in order to break through a lot of the tough stuff I'd encountered in my early years, I needed to burn off that karmic energy because it was severely hampering my life. And so those energies that I'd changed my name to, they spilled over into my business name and they were actually putting people off. So it didn't oh, matter. Wow. It didn't matter that I can do what I can do. 
because those energies were conveyed into the business name. So I had to change my business name in February this year to optimize it. Amazing. And now so, people like, are say, coming. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I so say now, now people are much more open to making the connection with me because the energies are different. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm. The sound is still coming in and out. So forgive me. That's but okay. let's say if we're talking about um, like a big company, like, you know, international business machines. Now, nobody says that. They just say IBM. So what yeah. would you look, what would you take into consideration? Would you take international business machines or would you take IBM? Um, you would possibly look at both, but you have to look at who owns the business name. Now, if, for oh, instance, if a company sells the business on, now you have to look at who was the originator of that business. And you, ha you would have to do basically the ceremony where you transfer that business energy onto other person or persons. Oh, wonderful. Do you do such ceremonies? Uh, I haven't done anything like that, but I know somebody who has. That's, and that's amazing. Oh, wow. And does so, it work? I mean, does it help? Yes. So if you if you'd sold a company and you didn't transfer the energy, that company would probably struggle unless, by pure chance, the people who bought the company aligned with its original energies. Amazing. Hi, Patu. Thank you for coming, for watching. i tell you why I'm also asking, because I noticed when I started giving you know, readings and sessions to people, I would, uh, the first thing I would ask is your name, not even their second name, just the first name and their date of birth. And then yeah. that helps me to kind of find my coordinates. And I, I, I remember once or twice, I couldn't really pin you know, down the person. Mm. And I just said, this doesn't make sense. And they said like, oh, because I'm known as this. I don't use my official name. So since, since, um, since that day, I just sensed that if you're used to a certain name, if everyone knows you by that name, that becomes your main signature. But what you're saying is that underlying issues remain. Well, yes. What was the age of that person that you read for? In their 30s. Right. Because as we go through life, uh, the, the birth name will always form the biggest part of the energies. But as we get older, mm. for instance, I'm, you know, getting on in years now. So I'm using... No, you're less. not. Stop saying this. <laughs> we are wise. 50 yes. is the new thing or we, we are yeah, wise, the new we are wise. But, um, <laughs> of course <laughs> the, the figure that i keep coming up with that seems to be the optimum number when you're around my age we seem to be running about 38 percent of that birth name and then you can uh, run more so of the energies matter. of the current name yeah oh fantastic so the energy changes with time as well yes in a so, sliding so things scale so things can get better as you get older. Yeah, they do. They do. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Let's end <laughs> things on a positive note. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Angela, it's not enough. I'm very glad that you came and I'm delighted that you've accepted to be here. And I look forward to hearing from the viewers. If you have any questions, text them. And I also welcome um, your comments when you watch the rebroadcast. And I'm very, very grateful to you, Angela. And I hope you'll come on the show again sometime in the future. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Ciao, everybody.